Today I'm going to show you how to build a simple pergola. This project can be easily completed in a day, except for the clematis, of course. They're going to take longer before they look like this. Now I'm not going to show you every single step in how to build this. I'm going to assume that you have some woodworking skills. You know how to use a skill saw and a square to draw a straight line. And you'll have to do some notching, which requires the use of a chisel. But other than that, the wood skills here are pretty simple. I built this pergola about 14 years ago and it's still in great shape. So I've decided to build a second one in a different part of the garden. And that's the one I'm going to show you today. The sides of this pergola are about 6 feet apart and it's about 4 feet wide, not including the overhangs. Now you can build it exactly the same way I did, have exactly the same size structure, or you can modify it very easily to be a different size. In a few minutes I'm going to show you some different size structures that I built using almost exactly the same design as this one. Here are the tools and supplies that you'll need. A square is a handy thing. I use it all the time for making straight lines. If you're going to put in the wires for climbing clematis or other types of vines, then you're going to need some wire and some of these eye hooks and a drill to drill some holes. The level is really important to get the whole structure correct. The wood we'll be using is one 4x4x12, four by four by and we're going to cut this in half to get two 6-foot lengths. If you have trouble getting wood in this size, you can buy some 8-footers and cut off a piece on each one. We need four 4x4x10 four by four by feet pieces, and these will be our vertical posts. And then we need 12 2x4x8s. All of this should be pressure treated lumber. That will just ensure that it lasts a lot longer. Now let's have a look at the pergola we're going to build in this project. This is a side view. It's a fairly simple structure, but it's very solid and is great for climbing plants. I've also designed it so that it's wide enough for two people to walk through comfortably side by side, and I can run my riding lawnmower through the pathway to go around the garden. On my older structure, I use these kinds of footings. They're concrete footings with a metal bracket at the top. Now the advantage of this kind of footing is that the wood never touches the soil. So the wood should last a very long time. The problem with these footings is that the structure is a little wobbly and it moves around more than I like. In fact, I've tried a variety of different kinds of footings and I've made a separate video to describe those. And in that video, I point out pros and cons of each type of footing and I identify the one I like best. And that's the one we're going to use in this project. But I'll put a link to that video at the end of this one. The vertical posts are going to be 4x4 four four, and across the top of each side will be another 4x4 four four to give this structure some support. And then across the center part we'll have several of these beams and you'll notice that they're notched. Now you could just lay them on top and toenail them, but that gives you a much weaker structure. By cutting these notches, the whole thing holds really well together. And that's what we're going to do in this project. The ends of the boards can be left straight. You could make a variety of different kinds of slanted cuts. You could even make some round cuts. But I like to keep things simple and I settled on this design. Architecturally, it looks quite interesting and yet it's fairly easy to make with a skill saw. I don't need to make any curves, which are always more difficult to make. But you can change the design to anything you'd like. When I first built this pergola, I didn't have these cross braces. But as mentioned before, I found that the footings don't hold the structure up very well. Now don't get me wrong, the structure is quite solid, but it does bend a bit left and right. And so I decided to put these braces on later. These braces make the whole thing much more solid. In today's project, I'm going to use a different kind of footing, and these braces are not needed for today's design. This is a larger structure that I have in the garden. It uses pretty much the same design, but because it's larger, I'm using larger pieces of wood. It's important when you're designing these kinds of structures to get the scale right. Scale means that the structure looks like it belongs in the space you're putting it in. And because this structure is larger, I decided to go with 6x6 vertical posts. The cross beams are 2x6s, 
again making them look a little more substantial. The header on each side is done a little different here. I decided to use two flat boards and then bolt them to the vertical pieces. This is a little bit more work, but the bolts make the whole structure very solid. Here's a 40 foot arbor that's built the same way as the structure we're going to use today. And in fact, I built this single handed. It's a little more difficult when only one person is building it because you kind of have to hold everything up and nail all the pieces on. But if you add a few extra braces, you can do this project on your own. The vertical posts here are six by sixes. The top slants are two by sixes. And then I've added these side pieces. These side pieces allow my clematis to climb up the structure a little more easily. And the design of those is very similar to what we're gonna do. Instead of notching the posts, I did add this extra piece in here. But the project we're doing today is a little smaller and this extra support really isn't necessary, so we're going to use some simple notches instead. All right, it's time to get started on this project. First thing you have to do is dig four holes. The dimensions on this diagram are center to center, so that measures the distance from the center of one hole to the center of the other hole. It's not the edge of the hole. The actual width of the hole isn't that important, but I find making it about one and a half feet wide works fairly well. If you make the hole too small, then it's a little more difficult to position the posts in the right spot. And of course, making it too wide is just a lot of extra work that's not necessary. How deep should you make these holes? Well, that kind of depends on where you live. So I'm in zone five, and our frost line is considered to be four feet down. Now I think that number is an old number from many years ago. I'm finding that anything that's two and a half feet deep does not move during the winter as the frost moves things up and down. So in zone five, I think two and a half feet is fine. I wouldn't go much shorter than that, even in warm climates, but in colder climates, you might want to go deeper. The side panels on this pergola are going to be 42 inches apart, and the area that you walk through is going to be 68 inches apart. One way to make sure that your holes are square is to also measure the diameter across from corner to corner, and that should be 80 inches. And again, we're measuring center to center of those holes. Once you have the holes dug, it's important to get them all the same depth, but that's a little more complicated than it sounds. And the reason for that is the soil level is not necessarily flat. So you can't measure the depth of the hole based on the soil around the hole, particularly once you start digging and soil gets left in piles around the hole. So this is how you make sure that the holes are the right depth. Pick one hole, doesn't matter which one it is, and we're gonna call that the master hole. We're gonna make the other three holes the same relative depth to the master. The black line here represents the soil level. And you can see that it's not very level. Take a two by four and lay it at the top of your master hole. Put a level on top of that two by four and raise and lower the two by four until it's level. Now use a tape measure to measure the depth of the second hole. It should be the same as the master hole. Because the wood is perfectly level, it takes out any irregularities that might exist in the soil and ensures that the relative depth of the two holes is identical. Now repeat this process with the other two holes. Try to get the depth as close as you can. If the hole's not deep enough, take out some more soil. If you've made a hole too deep, add some more soil back and tamp it down really good with an extra two by four. You want the soil at the bottom of the hole compacted as much as possible. If you don't get these depths perfect, you'll still have a chance to adjust them in a couple minutes. But try to get them as close as possible. It's going to save you some time in the long run. Now it's time to build some wood structures. The next thing to do is to build the two side panels. Each panel will look just like this. The piece across the top is your six foot four by four. Cut the ends the way you want, and then add two notches 
as indicated in the diagram. These notches are going to hold the two vertical posts. The vertical posts also have a couple notches in them. And those notches will be an inch deep and they will hold this side middle panel. Once you've got all the wood cut, nail it all together. Here's a couple secrets so you don't see a lot of nails when you're finished. The top six foot piece, I just nailed it from the top using some longer nails. The middle side panels, I nailed from underneath on an angle. That way you don't see ugly nails on top. The only nails on top is really the center vertical piece. That one that's 32 and a half inches long. And I used two finishing nails to nail it through the top. You could also toenail this from below, but finishing nails won't show off very much when you're finished. Nail the whole thing together and now build the second one identical to the first. The next step is to cut up the pieces that are going to go across the top, those top beams. Those are eight feet long. Shape the ends the way you want, and on each one cut two notches as indicated in the diagram. These two notches have to be wide enough to fit over the 4x4, four four, which is generally three and a half inches wide. Now how do you cut the ends? Well, take a scrap piece of 2x4 and cut it up the way you want. Once you're happy with it, then use that scrap as a template. Just place it on the end of each 2x4 and mark the shape. Then use a skill saw to cut off the pieces. By using the template, you ensure that every end is exactly the same. And as I mentioned before, if you don't like the design of my end piece, change it. You'll need at least two of these cross pieces made before you start the assembly process, but you might as well do them all at once. The way I make the notches on these is to actually take all seven boards at the same time, lay them on top of some saw horses, mark the notched areas, saw through all seven at once, and then use a chisel to notch each one separately. So this is what we're trying to put together. Take one of the side panels and lower it into the hole. Now if you have a helper, it would be great because they can hold this in place while you get the second one positioned. If you don't have a helper, you might have to put in some side braces to hold it in place until you're ready to put the whole thing together. But once you put these side panels in the holes, they actually stand up fairly well on their own. Now that you have both the left and right side in the hole, take one of the top braces and put it in position and nail it right to the top beam. This does two things for you. One, it holds the two vertical pieces upright, and secondly, it ensures that the space between those two vertical pieces is perfect. Now I have one other trick for you to help you make sure that this whole structure is nice and square. Take two extra two by fours and lay them across the bottom side pieces. These are just temporary boards that will come off later. But what you want to do is nail them into the side panels and ensure that the two side panels are exactly 65 inches apart. That will mean that the spacing at the bottom of the vertical posts is the same as the spacing at the top of the vertical posts. And that ensures that the whole thing stays nice and square. The whole structure should be quite stable now. It's still sitting in the holes, and the holes have not yet been filled with soil. Now it's time to check that everything is plumb and level. Take out your level and measure it everywhere. You want the horizontal lines all to be level, and you want the vertical posts to be perfectly level, and straight up and down. If anything is not correct, now's the time to fix it. You might have to shift the post a little bit in the hole to make it square. If one of the holes is a little too high or too low, you'll have to adjust that. Each post should be sitting very firmly in the bottom of that hole. And if need be, raise it up a little bit, put some soil underneath, and make sure that everything is level. The nice thing about this design technique is that you're in a position now to adjust almost everything. 
Assuming that you've made your notches in the right place and you've cut your pieces of lumber the right length, everything's going to be square or you can adjust that by adjusting the holes. Once you're happy with the whole structure, it's time to start filling the holes. Put two or three inches of soil in the hole and tamp it down all the way around with a two by four. Go to the next hole and repeat it and repeat it with the third and the fourth hole. Now take out your level and check everything again. You don't want to find out that something's gone out of alignment after you've filled all the holes. So you check everything again. If everything is okay, fill the holes with another two or three inches of soil. Repeat this process until the holes are completely full. When you're done, you'll find that the whole structure is really solid and everything will be plumb. Remove those two lower braces that we had put in because they're no longer needed. Those vertical posts are no longer going to move inside those holes. Add the rest of the top cross braces, spacing them nicely. The way I do this is put the cross pieces in place and then toenail them on both sides. Your structure is finished now, except for the extra wire for the clematis to climb up. I've designed these wires to use a minimum number of eye hooks and to give you fairly tight wiring. The wire starts at an eye hook at the top, goes all the way to the bottom, through the bottom piece, across the bottom, and up through the bottom piece, back up to the next eye hook. So you have one continuous piece of wire connecting two eye hooks at the top of the beam. And I use three of these on this structure. Locate the position that you want the eye hooks, drill a pilot hole, put the eye hooks in, attach the wire, run it through the whole system, attach it to the next eye hook. It's a bit of a tedious process getting the wires through the holes, but it actually goes quite quickly. Once the wire is pulled through the bottom piece, I use a wrench to give it a bit of a tug. I want that wire as tight as possible, and then I bend it across the bottom, up the next hole, and I use a wrench again to pull that wire tight so it's tight underneath that bottom board. The arbor is now finished. So finish off the pathway underneath it and start planting. If you like clematis, this is a great arbor. I find that you can put one clematis at the base of each post and so that you have two on each side. So this will hold four clematis all at the same time, which makes for a spectacular display. If you like other types of vines, you can grow them up the side and over the top. The structure is solid enough even for a wisteria. I have a number of other projects that you can build in the garden, and I'll put a link to those in the top right-hand corner. Have fun building your pergola.